patterns. Is this shift one driven by economics, by consumer preferences, or something else? Um, I think it's fundamentally economic. And then, obviously, consumer preferences can't be ignored. But the economic, I, I, my own research shows that the built environment is a reflection of the underlying economy. In the industrial age, you may not know this, but in the second half of the industrial age, our economy was really driven by building cars. About 40, 45% of our jobs were related to the raw material input, the manufacturing, building the roads for, servicing, financing, insuring, fueling, automobiles. And therefore, building drivable suburban places made perfect sense. The more you drove, the more you were wealthy. And so for 100 years, when you had a 2% increase in GDP, you also had a 2% increase in the most common way of measuring uh, driving, vehicle miles traveled, BMP. It went up one to one for 100 years. It peaked in 2004 in, in this country. We're now driving, even though we continue to grow about 1% per year in population, we are driving 6% less in absolute terms. The young people between 18 and 34, they peaked in 2001 when gasoline prices in real dollar terms were less than they were in 1972. And Young people, just as John mentioned about his, you know, he thought he had a deviant son. Well, he was a mainstream son. Their driving has dropped 23% in absolute terms. That's falling off a cliff in, as far as per capita driving, it's probably a third that it's down. And that's before we built all these great places like what we've seen Raw build. Um, so basically, the knowledge economy. You know, the software that we use to put these presentations together did not have to be shipped by truck. And the people who were putting together those software programs, many of them were working remotely, not driving to work. That's the structural shift. But, but interestingly, <coughs> when that started, people thought, well, this is going to cause a uh, spreading of the right, population. Right, exactly. Because that was a major don't have to be. It turns out that's not. I actually would approach it slightly differently. Um, I'm not, I think what Chris says is probably uh, correct, but I also think there's been a cultural shift in the country. Um, and if, you, if the simplest way to do it is compare television shows. Uh, when I grew up in the 50s, it was Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, Osley and Harriet. Dad took the train or car to town, mom baked cookies, waited for the kids to come home. And now it's Sex in the City. Uh, the Jeffersons, all of these different shows that are remarkably different. There's been a cultural shift in our relationship to cities. Part of it driven by the fact that during the 80s and 90s, we started to get cities right. Um, cities shifted from being uh, socially engineering places, as important as that was back in the 60s and 70s to try to build fairness in, to a, a group of mayors who said, no, wait a minute, first we have to get the city correct. We have to make it safe. We have to make it work. We have to, et cetera, et cetera. And then you had the boomers who all traveled to Europe because they saw great cities over there. And they came home. And they came home with a love of that urban environment. So I think a whole bunch of things are happening. But part of it is just a huge shift in our culture to a, a new love affair uh, with cities. And by the way, I apologize, but I need to run at this point for a call. This has been a great talk. <laughs> <laughs>
my gut tells me that you can see the future by looking at Rockville and looking at uh, Reston Town Center. That, that it's coming to a metro area near you. Um, and now part of the problem that, that Philadelphia has, and it's been notorious, and as a developer who developed, I mean, not that I've been on the front lines like Joe and Jason have been, but this region has ranked near the top of the worst places to build homes in the country. It takes forever. I mean, we have one project, what, took seven years? It was zoned for what we were proposing. We just wanted to do it tighter and, and have half the land be open space. And the only reason that we finally got the zoning was because, miraculously, Joe got a front page story of the Philadelphia Inquirer saying, why aren't we building walkable? Take this story, or take this development as the example. And we shamed them into <coughs> allowing us to build what we already had the zoning for. But it took seven years. That's you know, incredibly expensive. And you have to be a deeply demanded person to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I would add to that. Uh, among cities in the country, we rank fourth in terms of highest average cost of construction. The ranking goes to New York, Boston, San Francisco, and then we're tied in fourth place in Chicago. Now think about those cities and what they have in common. You know on Sesame Street when they show the objects and they sing that little song which these cities are one of these things is not wrong. And think about New York house prices, Boston incomes, San Francisco land values, and then think about Philadelphia. It costs as much to build here as it does in those other cities, but we can't command nearly the level of prices and rents. I, 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 my throwaway line is, you know, we have New York construction costs, but we have Baltimore rents and house prices. <laughs> now, if you're a car producer, for example, and you have a Cadillac that costs as much to make cars as it does Cadillac, you can only sell them at Kia prices. How much longer are you going to be in business? <coughs> that, that basically, in a nutshell, characterizes the home building industry in this area. And there's reasons why that is. Uh, we don't have the time to go into it today. Uh, but I also point out that in addition, you know, our, our older suburban uh, town centers and edge cities and the like they have a legacy of being formerly industrial places and they're very low income areas. Uh, DC does not have, places like DC don't have that legacy. So there is that historical legacy in addition that prevents <coughs> places like your Norris Towns and Potts Towns from, you know, becoming like your Restons or, or your Silver Spring. Patrick and Wendy. Thank you. I wanted to pick up on that gentleman's question. He said, simply, the words right out of my mouth. I've often wondered in our region the role of the older market towns. And so, um, contrary to his comment, I'd say Westchester is an example of how this transformation really is taking hold. I thought, Kevin, what you just said about the legacy of the industrial heritage is so interesting because, of course, Norristown is, is the exact contrast to, say, Westchester or Doylestown, which are doing well. Um, so I guess I, I wonder, Chris, I mean, you know our area. You grew up in Trek. Hill. I mean, how do we translate this market opportunity into a place that really has uh, numerous small centers that could all potentially be added on to and, and grown, as opposed to the likelihood in the, the D.C. area, which was such a small metropolitan area in 1950. Um, so it all naturally was greenfield development. Part of it is, you know, you know, the very first step is to have the intention to make fundamental change. And that's a biggie for a lot of the suburban areas around Philadelphia. That even though you may, and I may, find Norristown pretty depressing, there's a lot of folks in Norristown that you come in there with your fancy center city ideas and they're going to, you know, hang you. Um, they do not want to fundamentally change for whatever reason. Uh, so, if, if you can get over that hump, then it's a matter of putting in place an overlay zoning regime that makes the right thing legal. I've done, in my own personal development career, 12 projects. Every single one of them has been walkable urban, from Seattle to New Mexico uh, to back here. Um, and every one of them, when, they, when it was proposed, was illegal. And it gets old, always proposing to do illegal things. Um, it would be a whole lot nicer to propose something that was actually in the code. Uh, so that's certainly number two. The third thing is to look at the place as a place. And that, that adds to the complexity of becoming a fighter pilot. And uh, it takes more responsibility on, on the part of the private sector 
These I find work best when I do work throughout the country, not as public-private partnerships, but as private-public partnerships. You flip it, where the private sector takes the lead, the public sector plays a role. I was involved in downtown Lancaster with the strategy with Rick Grave, who was the mayor, still is the mayor, great guy. Um, and he understood, and, and, and John Fry, was that was at Franklin and Marshall, he's now at Drexel. And as you probably know, John's the, the only university president without a PhD. He's basically a, he's, he's, he's a, a developer, masquerading as a college president. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's done remarkable, you know, starting at Penn, then Franklin Marshall, now Drexel. Um, and that, you know, Rick Gray, the mayor, understood that while he could set the tone, he could, you know, get his bureaucracy to get behind it so he's not making stuff illegal. But his real job was to motivate the private sector to take the leadership role, to make those investments. And many times, Philadelphia suburbs, my impression is you still have that, that 1930s business is bad and, 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 you know, and developers are worse and we're gonna you know, rape and pillage them as, as much as they are gonna rape and pillage us. So it doesn't work. Anecdotally, just I mean, last week I was approached by the, the YMCA in our market, and you know, instead of instead of investing in kind of one of the boroughs that we have in our in our marketplace, or they want to be on a leftover piece of ground, so they some consultants convince them they need to be on some public highway. So it's, to me, I think it's just I think to get that point, just as a citizen, I think you know when we make decisions about civic infrastructure, we're still in, the ones I see are kind of made for the wrong reasons. I mean, they're they're made kind of investing. Start taking the library and the YMCA and all that thing out of these towns and villages, and all of a sudden, you know, that doesn't that doesn't help the story. So I, it doesn't solve that. It doesn't solve the, the issue. But yeah, I, mean, I, I just there's there's we, we we need more dynamic leaders. I mean, you know, Rick Ray's a great example in the small town of Lancaster, but I mean, you need leadership to stand up and say this is the way it's going to be. Wendy. Well, I I'd like to follow up on that. I, I think we all recognize that. one thing to be able to convince the municipal leaders that it's a good idea. But in my experience, even if you can do that, you're still faced with the community opposition, the NIMBYism, the, the no city in the suburbs. And I don't know how you combat that, because even if you throw municipal leadership, they will usually succumb in the end to those people that elect them. It's, it, do you have any recommendations? Can you talk about any of your successful stories and how dealt with that because I've just been banging my head against the wall completely. But well, what you're saying is the NIMBYism that you're seeing wave isn't right. waning here right. at all. Well, and, and so I'm, I'm just sort of reporting from the front that that there is a shift taking place <coughs> in different places throughout the country. So there is hope that if it happens in San Francisco and in Washington, it might happen here as well. I mean, I'm not guaranteeing it, but there's a hope certificate that I can hold out for you. Well, we're um, still faced with the first question being, what's the density? And, and Rob is saying that he wants that to be the last question yes. asked. How do you achieve that? Part of, <laughs> part of what we have done, and, and you know, folks in this room, we tend to talk in you know, units per acre and FAR and all these you know, technical things, when in fact, what the car business did and what the drivable suburban business did back in 1939 is they had you know, the Futurama World's Fair, or the exhibit at the New York World's Fair that showed this beautiful future of living in suburbia and driving every place. And 15% you know, of our parents and grandparents went to Futurama. It was covered by every magazine. And there was not a, not a technical term dropped. It was a gotcha by your gut. And you said, wow, how can we have that? So what we need is more examples. We need better communications, uh, better branding, if you will. But um, the reason it's why it's the default mode in Washington to build walkable urban is because there's now 43 examples. 15, 20 years ago, there were five. And it starts this upward spiral. 
so the, the, the neighborhood groups around the White Flint Mall had for 10 years been going down to Bethesda. And that's where they would go for, for, for movies and maybe work and restaurants. And they just said, why can't we have this in our backyard? It's, it's, it's the, you know, what John was just saying. Go off to Europe and say, why can't we have this here? So more examples lead to more examples. But you've got the catch-22 up front. You know, it's the same as when you're starting out in work. Gee, we want to hire somebody that's experienced. Well, how do I get experience? Well, get a job. But you're not going to hire me because I don't have the experience. But once you get over the hump, it does <coughs> start speeding up. Well, there, there's other, I mean, certainly, I mean, Joe and Jason know this game too, but you know, it, it, it's a marketing and PR game. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I tell everybody, you know, if there's 100 people in the room, 20% we walk in the door and they think we're the, I mean, you, you guys are great, 20% hate us, I mean, regardless of what we offer, and 60% don't know. So our goal is to get the 60 to, you know, to, to go, okay, I'm okay with this, and get that 20 down to 10 or 5, and that's where we look at, at you know, municipal leadership and say, there's gonna be five. I mean, you know, if you wanna run, if you want to make decisions on the future of your community based on what five people want to say about this project, you know, then I mean that's we're, we're we're going to have we now have that conversation early. Doesn't mean we don't miss it sometimes, but I mean somebody at the end of the day has to say you know we've heard you all, we appreciate it, we're moving forward. And so I mean I don't know how to get to five to zero, and I've never been successful with that. And so we've been some of our locust developers are using crowdsourcing, basically mobilizing the sun uh, folks who just don't have time to go to the neighborhood meetings. And it becomes real obvious that it is a very small minority that are yelling and screaming that you're just about to destroy the planet by, by this development. And I would add to that, I think one of the biggest factors that explain the resistance to change in the communities here is the fact that we rank quite low among large U.S. cities in terms of fresh blood, uh, attracting people either from immigrants from other countries or people from other places. We're America's fifth largest city but we're near the bottom in terms of the percent of our population that is uh, either immigrants or is from outside the region. Uh, and that's especially true for uh, educated uh, persons. Uh, I graduated from Wharton several years ago. There's not a single classmate I can think of that stayed in Philadelphia that wasn't already from here to begin with. That's just not true in other places. So you know, when you have that fresh blood, they're not as wedded to maintaining the status quo as people who grew up there. I mean, places like uh, Pottstown and Norris towns they're all from there, they all grew up there. They don't want to see change there. Uh, I was involved in a project in Pottstown a couple of years ago where they were considering the, the, the school district, they were scattered across several schools on the periphery of the town, and they wanted to consolidate them into one urban campus in the center of town. It was going to be this LEED certified, beautiful campus. And uh, we were hired to do an economic impact study, this how it would affect the tax base and property values. And it was this beautiful, gorgeous campus. The schools that were on the periphery of town were these old decrepit buildings that were falling apart. And this, you know, it's a very blue collar traditional township. They were absolutely adamantly opposed to this. And I couldn't figure out why. And it was just because, well, if they grew up in, you know, their parents' house, which they now lived in, and it was near the existing school, that meant green space they could walk to and play with their kids, and it was just changed, and that's how the community was when they grew up, and that's how it was gonna stay, and they were just against this. And uh, I just having I'm not from this region, uh, anecdotally, uh, it just you know, stuck out to me. I couldn't quite get this resistance, and it was just it was just change was just very threatening to most of the residents in this community. Yes. All right, as a, as a Wharton graduate who, from Boston who stayed here. I want to ask a little different question, uh, although somewhat related. Chris, you're the only one this morning who mentioned race, although in passing. But I want to ask you about race and some of these large trends. How much of it is impacted by race, changes in racism, changes in views by the younger generation about racism? I'm just I, I remember uh, Bill Maher, uh, kind of a little bit of a spokesperson maybe for our generation, for part of it. He, he had a comment on a show a couple years ago. He said, when we were young, our parents moved to the suburbs to, to get us kids away from black people. And today, our kids are like black kids. I mean, they, there's no difference. They listen to rap music, whatever. Culturally, it's changed. How much of that do you think is playing a role in these trends? I think it's huge. I think race has always been a huge factor in uh, real estate development. It's not spoken of openly, uh, but we all know it's, and, and I've, I've been doing metropolitan research for, I, I, before I got into development with Joe and Jason, I um, had the country's largest real estate consulting firm for 20 years, Robert Charles Lesser and Company, based in Beverly Hills. And 
we had office, six offices scattered throughout the country working on 600 projects for various developers. So I was looking at metropolitan development trends for a long, long time as to you know, why did cities grow, how they grew. And I, I came to three simple rules about any metropolitan area. You can figure out how they've grown over the last half century. If you know where the white upper middle income housing concentration is, and it always concentrates 60, 75, 85 percent of white upper middle income housing concentrates in one section. If you know where the local minority community is, and if, and if the topography allows it, it's on the other side of town. And if you knew where the transportation system is, and over the last, you know, the last half of the 20th century, that meant freeways, you could tell where the favored quarter is. The favored 90 degree arc coming out of downtown. And every metropolitan area in this country has a favored quarter. In Washington, it's to the northwest. In, in Denver, it's, you know, it's to the south. In Phoenix, it's to the northeast. And here, of course, it's to the northwest, going out the main line. And that's where 80, 90 in this town, last time I looked at it, 110% of all new job growth went into the favored quarter. Why 110%? Because the rest of the metropolitan area lost jobs in absolute terms uh, as they relocated out. And so absolutely, race has been a huge factor. Um, but this return to walkable urban places, more and more driven by a portfolio of transportation solutions, not just the car. And you've got a great portfolio here. It's obviously underinvested. You know, the R5, last time I took it, it reminded me of a Tudorville trolley <laughs> block going up the main line. Um, but um, you've got a tremendous asset here that you just underinvested in. And these, of those 43 places in D.C., 80% of them are rail transit served. That's not a coincidence. And by definition, it's going to be infill. It's going to be rail transit, you've got the system in place, it's just a matter of doing the zoning around those stations. I'm about to be picked up by Eddie Lipkin, if you know uh, him, he's a retail developer here. And he took on he took on the Ardmore train station for uh, about nine months until he was getting death threats from blue hairs in the lower manager. And then he said, I don't know what this. Um, so uh, race is key. Race is absolutely critical. It's becoming less of a of a factor, but racism in this country has been a 400-year-old scar, and it doesn't go away from that. Clay? Um, question about making retail work. I, I'm one of those people that put my birds to Northern Liberty, that dance out of the city with my wife. And there's, by the way, there's no 40-year-olds. It's 20-year-olds uh, and empty dancers. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, Blasting has tried valiantly to make retail work, and uh, I watch those shops. Uh, he puts people in there for no rent, and then they go out of business, and they can't make it work. Um, we ended up getting a dollar store the other day, which we're not thrilled about. Um, I was at a seminar the other day, and I heard Carl Dranoff. People were saying, well, what's the type of thing that you face as a developer? And, and our company does apartments, and he does apartments as well. He said, my biggest problem is the reason. It's just you can't fill it. It's disastrous. And, and and I've done a lot of rezones where towns have said to me, can you put retail on the ground floor to build above it? And I resist it like crazy because I go, it will fail. You're asking me to build spaces that will fail, that will never be full, will never be successful. Rob, I was in one of your jobs. You apparently get free rent to keep that little, you know, no free, you get free rent to keep that little shop full. And it was a gorgeous little shop, but I think you supported it, and I don't know if you still do. How do you make retail work? So, so the question is, what kind of retail? And I think what we've learned is, so there's, there's all the retail models that have a math problem and a, and a store plan behind them. And then there's the, really what everybody hopes to get, which is a little to keep owner-occupied stores where you know, everybody knows your name. And so we're reconfiguring spaces that are longer and not as deep so that the storefronts look like they're lit up longer. We don't need as many operators. But frankly, I mean, we're in the business of helping people get started in their businesses. The other thing we've done is we've figured out construction techniques to provide that space for relatively, I mean, we've cut our costs of doing that substantially. And so we don't need big rents. And then really the other thing is where we really make our money. We don't look at any of that, what we now call kind of village business. We don't look at any of that as, as really anything other than, you know, I mean, adding value for the, I mean, for the neighborhood and the homes we build around it. So I mean, those as an individual economic model wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't be a wise real estate investment, but they are when we look at the broader perspective, how we cover so 
answer your question, I don't think we, and I don't think sorted this out. I mean, we're certainly not done with it. Um, but I mean, there, there is a, I truly believe there's, if you can get enough people to walk to those places, um, there, there are a lot of people that want to be in business today that want three to 4,000 feet. Um, you know, I mean, that, that if they have customers that can get there easily, I mean, that's a market to some depth. And so that's, that we, I, we're getting closer to a model that works for us. That's, that's where we are. One last question. I have a question for Ron, but it's theoretical. It's a great conversation, it's great, but what are you seeing in, in um, uh, your uh, buyers' abilities to obtain mortgages or inabilities to obtain mortgages? And, um, what are you seeing trends there? Is that affecting the business? So um, you're either wholly qualified or wholly unqualified. Like there's, there's, there's not much gray anymore, so um, you know, there's hard and fast rules now in terms of I mean, what you have to fight us for that I mean, you just can't get the financing. But we're, I mean, we're seeing people at all demographics walk in and have I mean, excellent credit scores, and then we're seeing, you know, we're seeing those Have our survey results. I'm just taking notes with them. And, uh, so this is according to all of you. What um, uh, what uh, your current situation is, and then we'll compare with uh, the future situation. Uh, so. Brandon, actually, you need to help me with, with this a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think that the, on the left, so uh, on the left, you see the current home. Most of the folks here, 51 of you, are owners. And in your next home, actually more of you anticipate being owners uh, and fewer renting. Um, so you can actually see there's been this conversion, which actually surprised me and, and runs counter to a lot of what we see more broadly in the national statistics. Um, currently, most of the audience lives in walkable suburban locations, uh, 28 of you. Uh, the fewest live in rural locations. Um, as for the next home, there's this huge surge going from 17 to 28 of you moving to urban places. And I can say that um, I'm in that camp. Uh, my wife and I just bought a house in the city. We'll be moving here next, next summer. Um, so that, that holds true with the prevailing trends that spoke about. Size of current home uh, versus uh, the future home. Currently, most of us are in the 2,000 to 3,000 square foot range. Um, and it appears that, uh, that for the next home, will be smaller. So most of us are decreasing in size. Transit options, current home versus next home. So these uh, are not mutually exclusive, so that you could have multiple transit options for both your current home for your next home. And it appears that the bus is declining in popularity. I don't know how that works, but I think that um, uh, the train will become more popular, automobiles will be a little bit less popular. Commuting options, current home, uh, mostly automobile, next home, uh, public transit will be the principal way of commuting. How many in this room, raise your hand, if you actually walk to work? Right. Will the total cost of owning or renting your home, your next home, increase, decrease, or stay about the same compared to where you are now? And it seems to be a pretty uh, evenly divided survey in this regard. Will home ownership return to its peak? Seventy percent in the next five years. No, in the next ten years. Still no. And how much do you believe that house prices will change in your area from today in the next year? Someone thought it might fall by five percent. Uh, someone thought at the max it would grow by ten percent. Typically, it was three point one percent. And over the next five.
five years, we'll have average house price increases at 11.7%. I hope you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> Is housing a good investment over the next five years? And the overwhelming majority say yes. Time to buy. <laughs> And finally, what is the criteria that you are using for buying your next home? And these were the top choices. These are not, are these rank ordered, Brandon? Oh, generally, yeah. generally rank ordered. No, they can't be with the bottom one. <laughs> <laughs>